Hello and welcome to Films and That. My name is Rob Turnbull. And my name is Sam Hall. Today, what are we looking at, Sam? We're looking at uh, Will Hayes' Oh, Mr. Porter. And this was your pick? This uh, was my pick. Why did you pick this one? Because I just kind of want to talk about Will Hay, really, because he's just someone who's just gone to, into obscurity and he was quite a big star at one point. Cool. Let's have a look. Okay. A train station master gets lumbered with a seemingly impossible commission but tries his best to make it work. Is the station really cursed or is it just he's totally incompetent? As you alluded to in the intro, Will Hay, I'd never heard of him before but he was kind of like a household name in the 30s. Yeah. He's revered as a kind of comic genius, particularly like people like, um, I was watching a documentary Ronnie Barker was doing. Hmm where he was just saying about how incredible and influential he was to his kind of style of comedy. He left a legacy of humour on film and record that was inimitably his own, and those who knew him remember him with great affection. So hearing Ronnie Barker talk about this kind of made me understand how important he was to the development of comedy, because then two Ronnies were then very influential to other people. So it's where comedy got its start in Britain, I would have thought. Because before this, you wouldn't have had any kind of um, means to distribute comedy nationally, would you? Dr. Twist, you have earned the gratitude of the entire French nation. Oh, it's very nice of you to say that, but really the credit belongs to the boy. <laughs> so just a, a summary of who Will Hay was. Um, so he was, yeah, he was a bit of a prodigy. He was a musical comedian, if you don't know what musical comedians are. Uh, they were kind of like a, a type of comedian that mainly did stage theatre stuff. Um, it was usually a variety type show with sketches and character comedy. Like a good example of someone, George Formby, probably nobody's heard of George Formby, have they? No, but it's, uh, this is the thing, like <laughs> I've heard of George Formby, but mm. I've not heard of Will Hay. So like, why do you think he wasn't so, his name isn't known now, whereas people do know George Formby even a little bit. It serves you right, you shouldn't have joined it, Jolly Well serves you right. It serves you right, you shouldn't have joined, you might have been sitting tight. Um, I'd, maybe George Formby was just even bigger. Um, I mean, could you think about like Charlie Chaplin as well was another British comedian who, of course, he worked big in Hollywood and Stan Laurel as well. Uh, interestingly though, Charlie Chaplin and Stan Laurel um, were all uh, part of the same sort of group of, that were taught by this guy called Fred Carno. Will Hay collaborated with this guy as well. Fred Carno is actually the guy who popularised the custard pie routine, believe it or not. Um, the one that's still used by like Mr. Tumble today. So did he start off with his kind of school teacher character, is that right? Yeah, that was one of the more popular earlier characters that he had, yeah. So, but I think that's where his continued character that appeared in subsequent films, they would just sort of change the job role a bit. And it's always the same character. It's somebody who like at some school teachers, um, are very good at feigning authority and knowing, uh, looking like they know what they're talking about, but really they're, they're not as good as they think they are at doing it. And, you know, people are sort of cottoned on to the fact that they're actually a bit incompetent and they don't know what they're doing. And that's the kind of basis of his character that reappears in all, all of his films, really. <coughs> What's he want? New station master. <coughs> 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 Got a nasty cough, hey? Hey, hey, never mind about my cough. You show a little more respect for your superiors. And put that back where you got it from. And take your cap off. And you. Oh, Mr. Porter, did Will Hay write this? No, interestingly enough. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if he was involved in... He must have been. He might, yeah, because there's consistency in his films with, with the kind of um, the writing. Um, it's based on a story... Fuck. <laughs> I forgot the no, this guy's name, it was Frank something. Uh, not him. Uh, Mr. Porter. This is relevant, by the way. This is all staying in, by the way. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm editing this one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's based on an original story by a guy called Frank Launder or Launder or something like that, who also wrote The Lady Vanishes and a, a film called like um, The Night Train to Munich or something like that. So it's got, but a guy that seems to specialise in writing stories about trains. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, let's get into the story because it's not a, it's not really that important. But Will Hay has been kind of um, what's his name in this? It's, it's William called. Porter. His sister is embarrassed that he was a, he's got a job as a wheel tapper, and she insists he needs a better job. 
We don't think it conforms with our dignity to have a relative of ours tapping wheels. We've never had a tapper in our family, have we, Willie? Well, there was Uncle Joe. He manages to get a job as a station master at a, um, a station in the Northern Ireland border. It's called, just a, it's a really like remote location. Really it's remote location. It's called Buggles Kelly. It's a station that isn't well looked after. No one really visits it. So he's been placed no one in really charge. Visit, like literally, <laughs> there are no trains or something. <laughs> yeah. The next train's gone. What do you mean the next train's gone? There's no sense in that. It's like saying that the last train that came in hasn't... Hasn't what? Well, hasn't gone. gone. Don't argue with me. Come out and let me in. So William Porter has aspirations of making the station great. Yeah. So he's, he's stopping trains when they shouldn't stop and he's doing an excursion to... Connemara. Connemara. But then that kind of gets hijacked by um, gun runners. All aboard! Finish, please! Oh, I've got them. Uh, hey, what's that? You can't take things like that on an excursion. Oh, those are the goalposts. We all must take our own. Oh, I see. Oh, that's all right. This film didn't strike me as a kind of coherent narrative. It felt like a series of sketches, didn't it? It felt mm. like, oh, now the characters have got to do this situation. It's all about the situational comedy. Yeah. So they've got to move these train carriages and then hilarity ensues or whatever. Then next, they've got to decorate the station and hilarity ensues. That's not the way to spell it. There are two L's in Kelly. Can't have had 13 letters. Unlucky. Oh. Well, uh, well, take one of the K's out. Nobody will notice. Huh? So I think it's Windbag the Sailor was the first film where he introduced his two side characters um, who ended up being played by the same two people. Graham Moffat and Moore Marriott who play uh, the younger character, the younger uh, portly cheeky character. Cheeky fat boy, I think Cheeky fat boy, name. yeah. Uh, Albert is the character's name. And then more Marriott's character called uh, Jeremiah Harbottle in this. I'm not sure if he's always called Jeremiah, but he's always called Harbottle. And He's uh, like the old man character, but I looked and he was like 50 at the time. <laughs> and he's like four I, years older than Will Hayes. I'm well. pretty sure they, yeah, they did, they did him up a bit. They know that they are incompetent a lot yeah, of the time, yeah. whereas Will Hay tries to be above that, but he is the same level as them. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a particular scene where the old man is like stealing chocolate or something from the machine. Mm. And then he leaves because... Will Hay has kind of like chastised him for doing this. And as soon as he's left, Will Hay does the same thing. Oh yeah, and this, things like this keep on happening. Yeah, feel like throughout. Um, so he's just as bad as them, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they're not frightened of him or anything, but they seem to. He seems to manage to convince them to do what he says. They seem to be cottoned on to the fact that he's an idiot. Yeah. But um, but they go along with it anyway and end yeah. up becoming his like minions. We shall need Gladstone. What are you talking about? Of course you don't know who Gladstone is, do you? What do you mean the man who made the bags? Oh, Gladstone's our engine. Why did you tell me we've got an engine? He never asked him. Oh, come on, lead me to it. So I guess what all, sort of all leads up to all these, like, events is, is a series of, like, farcical moments and there's some slapstick comedy. They're talking about the station on the track and they're using sort of stones to sort of represent uh, what you know, what things are in that. And then the train sort of comes towards them. And then they get up and move out the way, you know, um, in a sort of something that's sort of reminiscent of like Buster Keaton or something like that. Um, so there's a little bit of that, isn't there? A little bit of like um, doing their own stunts, I think. It does feel like it's more um, just a bit of fun kind of film rather than trying to be yeah. this epic kind of well-told story. It's yeah, just, definitely. It's just, it feels like it's made for TV in a way. Yeah, because I, th I think Will Hay, like if he was around today, he would be... Uh, a sitcom actor. Yes, well, what can I do for you, Mr... Uh... My name is Murphy and I want some things. Oh, have you got your voucher? Is this what you mean? Yes, uh, are you sure you left them at the station? Of course I'm sure. Come on now, let's have them. Uh, well, uh, they've been here a long time, you know. Used to come sooner. <laughs> See, we've, uh, we've had rather a cold spell, and pigs are only human after all. The best bits were at, when they're at the station and the three characters were interacting with each other, mm. like trying to move the signal. And they're like, he's like winding this thing around, and they're just standing there watching yeah. him. <laughs> and they're going, oh, the and gate's like... broken. <laughs> <laughs> Just open it by hand. Well, why do you say so? So they just end up destroying all the trains they've got, all the carriages yeah. <laughs> and the, the coaches. Yeah. Including right up to the end, yeah, when the, the train that they were trying to save the whole time, they've just saved the day by capturing these gun runners. Why do you think that whole gun runner plot was in there? Because I didn't feel it needed to be there in there at all. It could have just been like, oh, we're just trying to do something and oh, something silly's happened. Well, I think it's like I said, you know, the Frank Lounder um, story that it was based on, like with Aeroplane, they took it and they made it into a comedy plot, you know, because they just like, we need a plot because the film has to have a plot. That's the way I see it anyway. It just smack of someone trying to write an actual story and then it mm. being changed. So yeah, mm. I do agree with you there. Yeah. 
But yeah, that does lead to the like the big set piece of the film is when they're at the windmill. Yes. <laughs> so they get locked in the top of a windmill for some reason, and then they try and get out by going down the sails of the windmill, mm. and it just they just end up kind of spinning round. There were some like funny scenes in the film, and that was one of them. I thought mm. there was quite a lot of the running around under trying to escape from the gun runners. I mm. found all that a bit dull. Did you find that? Yes, up until they were hitting them in the head with a shovel. How do you make this thing that is just a standard action piece in most films funny? Yeah. And that, that's kind of where the joy of, of Oh, Mr. Porter or any Will Hay film is really derived, I think. Didn't they wrote it or do you think it was improvised a lot of it? I'd be shocked if it wasn't at least a bit improvised. Yeah, particularly things like when he's on the phone and he's saying about how that guy's barn burned out. Mm. That feels improvised to me. The, the haystack's gone? And the barn? Whose barns? Oh dear me. And the house? Whose house? Yours! <laughs> I don't think that was written down in the script or whatever. It might just have been, oh, and then William Porter gets out of this situation in a funny way or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, there is a lot of Will Hay in there, I feel, even though it's not written or directed by him. It went off at six o'clock. When? What? It was scheduled for ten o'clock. Is that a different one to the ten o'clock one? No. Are you contradicting me? No, not you. You. Yes. But I still felt it was a bit blink and you'll miss it as well with a lot of those puns. Um, you really have to pay attention, which is difficult because of the sound quality, unfortunately. The production values aren't that great. So it's interesting to see how Britain compares to America at that period in time. Mm. It does feel low budget, would you not say? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say it's it's like one of the it's like a perfectly made film. Um, the director is a French director called Marcel Varnell, who then trained a bit in Hollywood, uh, as did Will Hay, and then they both came back to the UK to make films in that kind of in, slightly influenced by that Hollywood style, but obviously they had a British uh, crew as well. It's a bit of a mishmash, you know. So what did you think to this film overall, Sam? Um, it's, I have a bit of nostalgia for it, so it's it's kind of affected by that. I think you know the fact that my dad liked it, but I do think that I kind of like I, I recognize I do recognize that nostalgia. So I went into it with a sort of fresh mind, and I was still impressed by the the humor. Yeah, I'm I'm completely the opposite. I hadn't even heard of this guy before, never seen these films. Mm. So I went into this completely kind of fresh-minded, mm -hmm. I thought. Um, and I did find it a struggle to watch. Mm. I watched it twice and both times I was kind of like, oh, not, not too sure about this. Mm. But um, there were some really good gags that I liked. Didn't ever laugh out loud in it, though. Mm. It's just kind of like, oh, yeah, that's funny kind of thing. So I think... Oh, okay. I did. <laughs> I think a lot of it is down to mm. nostalgia. So Maybe. You, you probably show it to your kids or whatever mm. and then they like it. Um, so that is the kind of humor is subjective. A lot of the people who like him probably liked him at the time, and then they're just nostalgic for it. It doesn't. It's not really something that translates too well today. Obviously, I just love British comedy, so maybe maybe I'm blinded by that fact. Well, British comedy does tend to be about people who are failing, who aren't very good at what they're doing. Yeah. And there's nothing funny about someone being successful at something. We relate more to people who are, who are, fail, you know, who are failures, I think. And uh, whereas Americans, um, they can't let go of that American dream, mm. you know, and everything, everything they do has to be about that American dream. And it, to the point where it's called realist, you know, when people like when people fail. Yeah. You know, with here, it's just everything. <laughs> You can't destroy these. Uh, they're company property. Destination boys. Look, Belfast, Tipperary, Dublin, Cheltenham. Oh, you can burn that one. Okay, that's it for this time on Films on That. Thanks for watching and subscribing. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.